Good morning, everyone. Um, is my audio like working fine? Sound good to me. Awesome. Everybody else, can you just give me a thumbs up or something if you guys can hear it loud and clear? I got gotcha. you. <laughs> awesome. For everyone joining from Japan, I would say a very good afternoon. And everybody else uh, joining from the United States, a very good evening. Oh, we still have more people joining in. Okay. <laughs> I can tell everyone that joke I know. Yeah. I don't know. I just start singing. I just get a little bit of like, the summer wind came blowing in from across the sea. We'll just go. How's that song go? I'm not sure. <laughs> Old Frank Sinatra there for you, Al. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. So uh, I'll, I'm ready whenever you are. Yep. Just so. gonna give another five minutes, maybe, because people are still yeah just have like yeah in the waiting room i see my friend russell is in the audience <laughs> hey russell this we've done a few of these over the last few months actually uh the audio is really low michael on me for me yeah I, I can barely hear you and i'm turned up all the way let's see How i don't know if anyone else is having that problem this sound the sound better a little bit is this better? A little better? I mean, I just got to go a little closer. How's that? Yeah. Thanks. I'm just always worried about being like this giant head for like, everyone's going to be paying attention to literally a talking head. And my hair is way longer than it was in my promo photo <laughs> because of COVID. <laughs> um, people have been seeing Sasquatch sightings all around Chicago. Um, but that's just me walking my two dogs in the backyard. So do not be alarmed. It's just the person who hasn't had a haircut in a while. <laughs> hmm. Let's see here now. Right. Michael, where are you located? Right minutes, I think. Where am I located? I am in Chicago, Illinois. Okay, you're in Chicago. It's very cold. It's like nine outside, but that's fair enough, obviously, right. with Celsius. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a nice chilly night. So, so hence the, the mood lighting just in my house. We figure, well, we kind of give it a swanky sort of like having a drink at a, at a bar feel. I, I know that in Tokyo it's noon. I won't judge if you decide to break into the sake. It's totally cool. Like I was going to say, is that sake behind you? It looks like you've got some sake bottles back there. Yes, we do. We got some sake. Yeah. We got some. Uh, got some whiskey. Um, yeah. Once again, just trying, trying to do, trying to do something with the, <laughs> and make it interesting. At least try to, you know. Usually, I just wear like a black shirt. But my wife is like, "No, you're wearing the crazy shirt." I'm like, "You got it. I'm gonna wear this tonight." Kind of matches the whole blink look anyway, so it works out pretty good. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Or I should say, all right, Gato, because I must. All right. I think we should start. Yes, I'm ready when you are. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining in, um, especially folks from, you know, um, the United States and uh, everywhere in Japan and everybody else. Um, it's an honor to have you all. I can see a couple of familiar faces who are our regular, you know, folks who join us for most of the events. And it's awesome to have you guys back. Um, without, you know, dealing this further, I'm just going to start sharing my screen and I'm just going to give you guys a little bit intro about who we are, what is Blink, because I'm guessing some of you are new. Um, and then I'm going to let Michael, you know, take over the show. So let me share my screen. There we go. Everybody can see my screen. Oh, thumbs up would be great, guys. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. 
Okay. So our event for today is Art Advertising and US Japan Relations with obviously Michael Foster. And um, a little about Blink. Um, basically, we are a co working space. And uh, what makes us different or like what makes us awesome is that we are the only ones um, doing this in Tokyo. We are focusing in building kind of international community, like for Japanese and expats together. Like we want to, you know, people to work together, uh, come up with cool ideas, collaborate, create, and like do awesome stuff, you know? So that's basically our mission. Um, a little about Blink, like I just said, uh, the three C's for Blink would be creativity, connection, and collaboration. We do a lot of events. We uh, have people from all over the world working at our space. And uh, we just believe in like a uh, largest uh, idea of community, you know. Um, speaking of events, we do a lot of events. We've been doing events for about two years now. We've done about more than 200 events in the last year before COVID happened. And uh, these are the kind of events we kind of focus on, but we're always open to, you know, collaboration or ideas if you guys have any. Um, ranging from tech, business, art, media, lifestyle, culture, blink, gathering, which is kind of like a social gathering we used to do. Uh, we are on Facebook, LinkedIn, Line. If you guys use Line as well, please add us there. I'll share a small QR shortly, which you guys can like just scan, which is over here. If you guys want to take a minute and just scan this on your phone, you guys can connect with us on Facebook and always be updated about the cool stuff we do. So I'm just going to let this be on your screen for like a minute for, for the guys who don't follow us or are not friends with us, please do so. Okay. And uh, I just have a small video I want to share with you guys. Won't take more than 40 seconds. I hope it's okay with everyone. A thumbs up would be awesome. Cool. Okay. Okay, then let's play the video. Okay, that is mostly it from my side. And uh, if you guys have any questions in the future or anything, if you guys want to know about Blink or anything, feel free to like reach out on Facebook, LinkedIn, or like you can just drop in your credential later on. I'll get in touch with you guys. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to let Michael do his thing now. Over to you. Okay, there we go. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, to everyone, thank you so much for coming. Uh, to my friends in Japan, as well, that I don't know you, and for my friends uh, here in the States, I'd say konbawa or just good evening. Um, we're going to have a little bit of fun. This is going to be a little bit of a roly poly sort of event, and uh, I hope you enjoy. For me, this conversation, what I'm having here right now, started 38 years ago in December of 1982. I was in second grade. And you know how when you're a kid, they give you projects, right? And for us, the teacher decided we were gonna do a, like a Christmas book and we're gonna do all these different drawings and each page was a different theme. And that was gonna be our gift to you know, our parents. And I had forgotten about this book. 
for many, many years. And then when my parents were kind of, they were going to move from their town home to, to a house and they were going through their stuff. They presented me this book, say, hey, Mike, you remember this? I said, well, yeah, I, rem I remember this. Uh, I remember this book. And flipping through the pages, I have a pretty good memory. So I could actually see all the things that made sense to me. It was like, oh, Tonka truck. Oh yeah, I remember I had a Tonka truck as a kid. Dukes of Hazard Racing, so I remember that as well. And then one page was called A Secret Place I Like to Go. And here I had drawn this very elaborate illustration of Japan. Now, this is 1982, so there's definitely no internet. And I grew up in a little town called Mokina, Illinois, way on the far south side of Chicago. So needless to say, our library wasn't exactly the Smithsonian. I was really stunned because I tried to remember, oh, why did I draw, draw this? How did this happen? So just doing a little bit of research, I remembered that in second grade, we had a contest, who's the kid who could watch the most National Geographic specials and then write a report. Of course, I being the overachiever that I am, I to give you a little star every every week you did and mine went all through the all, all through the year. So looking up the um, the the programming, because um, now you can do that. We have the internet, it's not 1982 anymore. And National Geographic had done a special, I think it was like 8081, it was called The Living Treasures of Japan. And it was all about how in, in Japanese society, um, people who are people who are artisans are considered national treasures and they try to pass on the knowledge uh, from generation to generation. And through YouTube, I was able to watch the special and sure enough, about halfway through, um, they did a shot of Osaka and there was that drawing. I, that's where I was inspired and it led me here. So here we are. <laughs> it's amazing how all these little things that happen when you're a kid can just completely change your life forever. And so for me, my name is Michael. Uh, I've been in art and advertising for 20 years. And right now, that's all you really need to know about me. Because really, in the end, this is about you. I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. I'm going to come at you from a lot of directions. The purpose of this, I hope, in the end, is that it puts everybody in a flow state. That everybody kind of feels a little more inspired, a little more energized, just a little better. Because quite honestly, it's been kind of a drag the last year. So as that song goes, come with me and you'll be in a world of imagination. <laughs> that's where we're, that's what we're doing. So part one, advertising. Things I've learned over the last 20 years. The first thing is, and I know people think they're being nice, but never give a creative a sign that says be creative. I see, we see that, we know that's gonna be three dozen revisions. <laughs> Christoph Kielowski, the director of the Three Colors Trilogy from 93 to 94, when he talked about filmmaking, he said, every frame, every instant of a movie needs to inform the audience and move the story forward. You can say that a lot about life, but especially in advertising, that is especially true. And I found that over the course of my career, things coming at me from a lot of different angles helped me understand marketing even better. Like perfect example, around 2007, moved to Seattle, I was really getting into game theory and also particle theory because, you know, of course I was. <laughs> Specifically, Brian Greene's The Fabric of the Cosmos. And the thing about probability theory and particle theory is that, as you probably are somewhat aware, there's never a for certain chance that something is going to work. And when you think about marketing, that's al that almost applies exactly to that. You can have the most beautiful advertising campaign. You can have the most beautiful, just brilliant idea. And it could work, but sometimes it doesn't. And so always remember in the back of your mind, when thinking about advertising, think about particle theory. It's a wonderful analogy. Now, before we really get into advertising, we have to talk about advertising slicker, salesman of the year, award winner, younger brother with the cool tie and the, and the, and the hair, marketing, which people have talked about marketing for decades. And the first thing I think people always want to know about marketing is they try to narrow it down. Like, well, what kind of marketing do I need? On the late, in the late 90s, Seth Godin, who was working in Yahoo, I think he was actually running Yahoo at that time, talked about permissions marketing, which is where you shape your, you know, the message so the customers are willing to accept it. In 2004, Alex Whipper, Whipperfirth, yeah, amazing last name. Alex Whipperfirth wrote about brand hijacking. And the idea was almost like weaponizing consumer-driven word-of-mouth branding. 
in the late 2000s, Gonzo Marketing by Christopher Locke. In the early 10s, they talked about blue ocean strategy, and that was finding uncontested market space. And there's guys like Gary Vender, Venderchuk, who has a great idea like every five, 10 minutes. Now I've studied this for a lot of years. I'm gonna do a quick little screen share here. So let's see, I'm doing my own slideshows too. So you have to bear with me for one moment. Oh, here we go. If you feel like you missed the boat on marketing, I mean, I can, under, I can understand. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Share screen. Ah, here we go. It's kind of a DIY feel tonight. So in 1999, Sergio Zyman wrote The End of Marketing as We Know It. And don't feel bad if you feel like you missed the boat because 2019, Carlos Gill wrote The End of Marketing about humanizing your brand in the age of social media and AI. And if there's a $1 million idea I can tell you about tonight, 10 million an idea, is that you should write the book in 2039, the end of marketing because the robots are trying to kill us or whatever is happening. <laughs> marketing seems to have this 20 year cycle. It comes and it goes, it comes and it goes. And I have read plenty of material in my time about this. And so, Let's see here, if I can get back to my screen and who, what I am and who I'm doing. I've never done this before where I've tried to do my own slides. Let's see, I'll stop the share. Ah, there we go. I think I'm back. Nope, start the video, I'm back. I'll have to get better at that someday. <laughs> Is that marketing, 85% of the marketing books are gonna tell you this same two things. One, you have to humanize your advertising because the old institutional system, whatever it is, isn't working anymore. And why is that? The second thing it tells you, because people get pretty wise easily. So you have to come up with a new bag of tricks that seem just more relatable. Now, if you're in the business, you definitely need to read all those books so you kind of remember what layer of the matrix or the dream, whatever that you're working on. But I found that the best marketing and advertising people do two things very, very well. One, they break through biases and they implement reinvention techniques to the brand. And how do they do this? It's done, we do it by using the dynamics of what they call the knowledge quadrant. And we look for the unknown unknowns. So to take a step back, when you talk about a human being, there are like these four quadrants, there's like, there's stuff that you know about yourself that everybody knows about you. And the second quadrant, there's stuff you know about yourself that nobody knows. The third quadrant is people know stuff about you. People know stuff about you that you don't know. And that fourth one is the famous unknown unknowns. When you apply that logic to a business, that's where the best marketing happens you, or the best advertising. You, you look at a brand, especially that's existing, and you do your research and you do your studying and you try to figure out, okay, where is, is there a new place we can take this image, this idea? And if you ever get stuck, you know, you always go back to the basics. They used to always say that in a business, you get two out of three. You can compete with quality, you can compete with service, or you can compete on price. You can't compete on all three. You can do two out of three, that's it. Over the years, people have added a couple more. You can compete on knowledge and you can compete on atmosphere, like if you're a cafe, in which case you get three out of five. But the biggest mistake a lot of businesses make, especially in advertising is they try to compete on too many fronts. You just can't do that. And part of the reason why I think this has always been so hard to comprehend is that I remember when I was younger and we can go to stores because COVID wasn't around yet. I would check out the marketing book section and then I'd look at the advertising book section and I'd be like, well, where's the marketing book? And the store clerk was always like, it's way over there. And it never made much sense. Like, why isn't the marketing and the advertising and the graphic design books all in the same place? Because they're this, there's different sides of the same thing. And so hopefully tonight, part of the things we're gonna do is by kind of doing this in, in this particular way is to start putting pieces together. 
and a perfect example of this, I remember my career about, this is like eight or nine years ago, I was working for an electronics company and we were doing a lot of SEO sort of like research. And I'm, I'm a kid from the nineties. So, you know, they always talked about the top 100. I was like the bottom 100, like where, where's where the opportunities are not always in, in the first 10 rows. And we found out that they were looking for Bluetooth TV or how to hook up my Bluetooth to my TV. Right. And they were all different. So they didn't weren't placing very high, but they were definitely placing in, in a lot of different places. So we said, well, what we can do is why don't we put on the front page of our website since people are coming this way anyway, like a little thing saying, how do we put, this is how you hook up your device to your Bluetooth television, <laughs> whatever, like we did it. And you click on it and it had a simple explanation. And it said, if you still have trouble, purchase this item. And sales went up 25% in one month, just because we recognized that opportunity. I think so many opportunities are missed because you have the advertising department over here, you have the marketing guys over here, you have the design people over there and nobody's really talking. And that's why a lot of companies or even just small businesses, you just miss out on these opportunities. So without further ado, after 20 years of being in the advertising business, here are five rules of the ad game that I've learned and also could be applied to life in general. Rule number one is the most important one. The most important thing is when you're talking about your advertising, when you talk about your brand, you're talking about your company, your look, the essence, a love mark, that comes first. You got to have a great website. You got to have a great presence. A lot of people, they like to throw a bunch of stuff at you right from the get go. They want to, you know, really get the mathematics involved. We need to hook up this. We need to do that. And they get this, and they develop pipelines, which are important. But if the website's terrible, or if the branding isn't working, you could have all the wonderful advertising you want leading people to the site. But it's like the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it water. You know, you can't, the horse ain't going to drink the water if it's like a muddy little pool. Like if you're going to lead a horse to water, it should be this great oasis with several lakes and maybe some horses in towels sipping on wine spritzers over by the sauna. Like make it, make it important. You're asking people's time. You want to you want to make sure that it's worth their time if they're going to make the journey to see what you're offering. The best graphic design, and this is going to be kind of a recurring theme for tonight, I find utilizes the concept of analogy. And what I mean by that is that the visuals, the messaging, the branding, it's an analogy to the relationship that your customer has with the experience with whatever it is you're doing. It matches, it makes sense. You know, in the nineties, a lot of companies didn't get that. You had a lot of guys who were ad people who were really just wanted to be artists. They went into advertising. So they did commercials, they did things that they liked to do, but it didn't really help the, the company that they were working for. The most famous one was the, in the nineties, if you were in the States, they had this little Chihuahua for the taco, for Taco Bell and he was, crazy and everyone loved the Chihuahua and we do, there was these really fun commercials and Taco And the reason being is because, and the experience of watching these really fun commercials doesn't match the experience of going to a Taco Bell with sometimes a disinterested young person who just gives you your food. It's not a, exactly as exciting as that Chihuahua. That happens a lot. It used to happen a lot. It's gotten better over time. And once again, I think the mathematics, the data, it's all very important. But without the great brand, the great look, it doesn't mean anything. And I think a lot of people, it seems so obvious, but they overlook that point. Also, too, really great advertising brings in customers you want, but also keeps away the customers you don't want. When I first started this journey, like 20 years ago, I worked for um, uh, an affiliate of the Chicago Sun-Times and they wanted me to design a booklet for Oktoberfest. And I was thrilled. This was like one of my first big assignments. And I literally must've spent hours. I was, it was beautiful. It looked like a prop from an Indiana Jones movie. And I remember my art director came in and she looked at it and she says, this is, this is really beautiful. This is, this is gorgeous. But you have to understand that the people that are attending Oktoberfest, they, there's an alligator 
they wrestle this alligator, they get very inebriated. So it's not really, and I was like, oh, I, <laughs> so, so we, so we changed it. Luckily I'm a cartoonist. So I drew a guy in lederhosen with a, a sousaphone and an alligator and it still looked really nice, but it was appropriate for the audience. Something that we always forget about. And it also gets back into that main point. And when I talk about thinking in analogies, uh, Douglas Hoff, Hofstadter, and he's a Pulitzer Prize winning author, you know, he really digs deep into that. Um, he wrote a book called Surfaces and Essences. And basically he felt, he feels, and, and I agree with this, that human beings, we see the world through analogies. We compare and contrast. That's, that's the fundamental connections on how our brains process the world around us. And you even think about it, like I remember reading once Alan Watts saying that it's kind of like a trick they play on you. Like you might be behaving a certain way and they say, well, that's not you, that's your brother. You behave like yourself. Well, what does that even mean? <laughs> Compare and contrast. Um, in, in, in terms of phrases, like you can say, hey, how many Kurosawas, Akira Kurosawas do we have in the audience tonight? I don't have to explain, well, maybe to some people who Akira Kurosawa is, but you understand what I'm talking about. Or a more simple phrase, like a life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get, that old famous Forrest Gump phrase. It, what's great about a great analogy, and especially when you apply it to marketing and advertising, it is just the most efficient way to establish meaning quickly. It's like you're packaging together context in a streamlined delivery system. And it kind of feels like magic. We'll get more on that later, but we're going to go to rule number two right now, which is that, and this is a, this is a quick one. A lot of times in marketing and advertising, people use the wrong tools for the wrong purposes. When I first started, I used to always ask people, what do you need a website for? They call me up and, hey, we need a website. I'm like, well, what do you need it for? I know it's probably smart, actually, smart alecky. I was in my twenties at the time. Um, but what I really wanted to know was, what do they want the website to do? Do you need it to gather leads? Do you need it to show off your services? It needs to have a purpose. And also too, because I grew up in Chicago, you know, we're Midwesterners, you know, if you really get talking about art and conceptual stuff, I mean, sometimes they just look at you like you got scorpions coming out of your ears, which I think some of you are probably looking at me like that right now. It's good I can only see a few of you up there on the screen. <laughs> You know, but yeah, you, you make a brochure. I, you know, a lot of times I get a brochure, it's like, here, you throw this out. It, do you need a brochure? Do you need social media? Of course you do. But what do you need it to say? What do you need it to do? Part of the nice thing about working in the arts, and especially because I've worked in television and I've worked in, in, in painting, I've done all different types is, is that if you have a great idea, it's wonderful but find the right tool, find the right avenue to execute that marketing message, that advertising message, that whatever, that creative idea. Find, find the tool that's most appropriate for that. Don't start with the tool and then try to figure out what to do with the tool. Start with the idea, then apply the tool. And another little side note about advertising and this is whether you're a huge company or just a startup. Um, not only do I consider advertising <laughs> like, like uh, particle theory, there's a certain random element to it that you'll never be able to shake. But when it comes to money, advertising is a little like the casino. Don't spend it if you can't afford to lose it. And I've seen this happen a lot of times. I remember back in the late aughts and the late O's when we were in Seattle, you know, Google AdWords was becoming a big thing. And there were a lot of shops that were just throwing tens of thousands of dollars at Google AdWords and they went out of business because they weren't sure how to use the tool. And unfortunately, I think, especially in the tech world, there's a lot of these inflated promises. If you build it, they will come. And the fact of the matter is, not necessarily. Rule number three, and leading into what we're talking about before, beware of, <laughs> beware of uh, promises. Um, a lot of times companies now, the big sell is you're gonna go viral. You know, it used to be a uh, first page on Google. <laughs> There's always something. Um, I would say be very wary about promising that something is going to go viral because truth is, it's really hard to tell. And if you are creating work, 
it's hard to tell if that's going to go viral. Now, if, if to understand what goes viral, it has to excel in four ways. It's either got to be really insightful, really hilarious, really inspirational, or as we've learned over the last few years, controversial. Now, to me, between those four elements, inspirational, if you want to create that brand, that, uh, that brand that everybody loves, like Apple, you know, Nike, the, the greats, inspirational is the best place to try to execute that. Um, and when I talk about love marks, just so you know, this was a concept that was brought by a gentleman named Kevin Roberts. He was the CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi back in the day. And he wrote a book basically trying to explain why certain brands are just beloved and others are just sort of meh. We'll talk a little bit, a little bit about that as well. <laughs> um, what kills great creativity and a lot of times the chances of something going viral? And you might have experienced this in your work in, in a different way. A lot of times you come up with a wonderful idea and everyone's all for it. It's exciting and it's great. And then all of a sudden they say, well, made it, made it. I mean, are we going to offend anybody? Is this going to bother people? And then all of a sudden all the comments come in and then you go, you regret, you do regression towards the mean. You just get a bland brand. You get a bland message. You, I'm sure we see it all the time. You ever watch a commercial and you're just like, Ugh. I just wasted, well, depending on where you're from, 20 or 30 seconds of your life. And you just, it just sucks the air out of you. And you know what happened? There was a really great idea. And then somebody in the executive team said, yeah, but we got to make sure like everybody gets it and, and nobody is offended. And then you just, you get something that's boring. Part of that is instinctive because people don't like to lose. There's a wonderful line in the movie Moneyball where he says, I hate losing more than I like winning. It's true. We're all engineered <laughs> to hate losing because that flight or flight is still in us. We like, you know, we want to win, but we really don't want to lose. There was um, a professor years ago used to do this uh, raffle. It was, it was a $20 bill raffle to illustrate this point of why people don't like to lose. And so he had two rules for the raffle. One was you have to bet in dollar increments, no change. So do I hear $1, do I hear $2, do I hear $3? And the second rule was, is that the first and second place person has to pay. So things would go you know, accordingly. Do I hear one? Do I hear two? Do I hear three? Do I hear four? But something interesting happens around 13 and $14. Now the top two people are in a competition. And the way the instructor would say it was, it was funny because everyone always got a little bit of a chuckle after the raffle for the $20 bill went past $20. Do I hear $21? Do I hear $22? The highest it ever got at the time from what I understand was $128 for a $20 bill. We don't like to lose. It's loss aversion. And so when I think about it in terms of marketing and advertising and, and the art world we live in, you know, it is instinctual that we like to hedge our bets, but don't hedge your bets and don't follow somebody off a cliff. Another story, this is a more personal story, back when I was still working for that Chicago Sun-Times affiliate 20 years ago, we would get a little disgruntled with the carpet cleaner ads. Now, I don't know if you have this in Japan. I'm sure you do, but in America, you have these carpet cleaner specialists. This is back in the newspaper days, so you get a full page ad. And these two guys, these two competing carpet cleaner companies, they kept seeing what the other one was doing and then they had to add more. And they just kept doing this. And then eventually, you know, you have a page filled with, it was, it was almost like modern art. It was like, it wasn't really an ad for carpet cleaners, but more like a Jackson Pollock. And he put his daughter on the image and he's like, yeah. And she's on the phone like, hello, you know, carpet person. And then the other guy said, well, that's not cool. So he put his younger daughter on the phone for his ad. And then this kept going on. So finally, we got to the point where there was a baby on the phone. And then the salesperson comes to me and says, well, Mike, you got any ideas? I said, do we have an ultrasound maybe? Like uh, an embryo we could put on the phone? And of course, 
you know, gave me a, read me the riot act for that. I find that if you're going to be funny and a little sarcastic, it helps to be a lot older. When you're 40, people kind of laugh and think you're kind of kooky. When you're 20, they just think you're a smart aleck. <laughs> Now, how to overcome the issue in business and in advertising, especially when you're working with people or even yourself. I've learned, and the truth is the real secret of advertising is managing expectations. You're managing expectations in your messaging, in your advertising to people who are interested in what you're doing, but you're also managing the expectations to the people in the office. Because in this business, there are no silver bullets there are no absolutes and advertising is ongoing it's a process it's a flow state it's changing it always was that way but especially now in the world of social media it's changing all the time it's changing faster than we can keep up a perfect example like a lot of people when you use google adwords you just leave it up and you see what happens you have to prune your Google AdWords. Another little pro tip. After, wait a couple of weeks and find out what weird search terms people are finding your website using and you're paying for it. Like I, my day job, I work as an art director for an IT firm here in Chicago. We would run ads for Python. And so after a couple of weeks, you start seeing the search terms that people are finding your site and sure you get, you know, you get people who are looking for coders, but then you also get snake petting zoo. So you got to get that out of there. You got to make it go away because, <laughs> because that'll just eat up your budget. And if you're in a big company, you know, it's all about performance. It's all about your, your quarterly reports. And if you're just a small time business, I mean, that's your money. You want to make sure you're not spending more than you have to. Always remember that marketing and advertising this whole business is a conversation that you're having with your clients, both new and potential. And internally, you have to fight that wall of confirmation bias. And confirmation bias, what is that? And the that's the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, or recall information in a way that affirms your prior beliefs. You find that a lot, especially in existing companies. They have a way they do things, they have a way they've advertised, and they don't really necessarily like to veer too far away from that. And that's something that over time and through experience, and sometimes that person is yourself. You have to wean away from that safe bet. And getting back to the whole thing about rule number three, like you want things to go viral, you know, don't hedge your bets, don't play it safe. The more creative, the more inspirational, the more interesting the work, the art that you're putting out there for your advertising, the better chance it has of success. And I've seen it way too many times where companies will play it safe and then they wonder why they're not getting the results they want. Rule number four, time is not money. They always say that time is money, it's not. It is way, way more important than money. And I, you know, rule number four, time is more important than money. It's also the never ending battle of avoiding knuckleheaded stuff. In the end, when you're running a business, the point of sale, whether you're offering a service, whether you're offering a product, everything needs to revolve around that. And your advertising needs to feel like that experience of engaging at that point of sale. And I'm not saying you, you need to shortcut or squeeze pennies. I'm not one of the, like, it's not like that in a business sense. I'm not talking about not being a cheapo and trying to cut corners. It's really about making sure that all the work you do in advertising, whether it's advertising or even just in general, this is actually more of a general rule for work, especially people who are self-employed. You can spend a lot of time doing stuff that doesn't make you money. And you could, I've seen a lot of people lose their business because they got so tied up with stuff that wasn't important, but it felt like it was important. A little simple example was like, I never did my own accounting because first of all, I should definitely stay away from numbers, but also too, because it was, it wouldn't have been time well spent. It was worth it to pay an accountant to do a really good job as opposed to me trying to figure it out. That, that is an extremely, that is an extremely important point. And 
the thing about these divergent paths, these things that suck up your time, it kills your bottom line. If you're, a, if you're self-employed, I know a lot of people who worked their brains out, but they just weren't making money to make ends meet. And if you're a big corporation, the lack of project management and getting caught up in knuckleheaded stuff just creates a lot of dead space. And that's why you get a lot of those guys who've worked for corporations for years and they just kind of feel a little dead inside <laughs> because there's too much dead space. And that comes to, and this is something we're gonna talk about in, in the promo was the problems with like project management. Now, if you've ever heard of design thinking, design thinking is a way to put empathy, which is you know in the, in the process of planning. Um, it counters optimism bias. And that is a critical flaw anytime you're putting up a plan. Like in advertising, for example, or if I'm designing a website or if I'm working on something, I make my estimate and then I usually tack on about 20% more time and money in case I need it. We all tend to think that when we try to do something, and this is just everyday life, it's always going to turn out better than, you know, it's, oh, it's going to be great. We're going to get this done in a day. Like you, we always try to think that, but it's not always the case. If anything, something goes wrong, that's how a five minute project becomes a five hour project, which becomes a five day project, and then a five week project, and then everybody's just angry and upset. So it's, it's really important. Project management is very important. And it's important to really have a clear understanding of the entire process. And, and, I'll, and I'll use a, a, an example. Like it, I remember when I was uh, working for a company a few years back, um, they were, we were gonna build a website for them and then we were ready to sign the papers. And then the client had asked us, well, we also need to put a reservation system to this. And my boss at times said, oh, sure, that's cool, we can do that. And I remember going, wait a minute, you just, you're just throwing out a reservation system? That's a huge, that's a huge thing. <laughs> How can I, oh, you're smart, you'll figure it out. I mean, I get that a lot and it's very complimentary in some cases, but it also keeps me up at night and makes me very, very stressed. <laughs> so, and, and unfortunately, I think everyone was sort of happy. We did kind of pull it off, but we weren't managing our, ex, we weren't managing our expectations correctly. We were <laughs> over-promising and under-delivering because well, we threw in a whole new thing. This happens all the time in project management. Rule number five, and this is a rule that's gonna cause a lot about a little bit of controversy. As of 2021, data is not gonna solve everything. Not yet. Going back to that movie Moneyball, you know, if you've ever seen it, it's it's all about like, you know, Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill comes in and he puts a, you know, he said, look, you mathematically figure out some great Oakland A's players. And then all of a sudden, hey, everything's great. But when you read the book and you know the true story, the fact of the matter is, it wasn't just the computer guy who was helping the team. There were several things happening at once. A lot of it was just the traditional stuff, having scouts, having coaches, like, it worked in addition to what they were already doing. It did change the game forever. It changed baseball forever, sure, and everyone uses it now. But it's not, the myth is, is that it's the only thing they're using. It still isn't. And a fun little fact, data is not being used properly by most businesses. 95% of companies are not using their data right. 95%. And also too, even if you do start looking at your data, depending on how you look at it and how you interpret it, well, you know, you might extrapolate several different ideas. Now, if you not, don't believe me and you're a data head and I believe me, I love data. Um, here's a fun little thing. Now you guys, I'm sure all probably listen to music. So like, do you ever like have a favorite band and then you go to Spotify or Google music or, I think Google Music's gone. I think it's YouTube Music. And then it says, well, if you like this band, you'll probably like all of these bands. And how many times you say, I don't like any of these bands? <laughs> it's not <laughs> because music is so intricate and so personal that, yeah, sure, you might like, you might like Wednesday Campanella, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to like Bish. <laughs> it's because it's, it's a personal taste. I know for me, for example, like the song 
Tiny Dancer uh, by uh, Elton John. I don't like Elton John and I can't, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a big 70s classic rock fan, but they sing that song together as a group in the movie Almost Famous. So I like the song Tiny Dancer, not because I like Elton John, I just like that scene from that movie. There are so many things that can throw off the algorithms and we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. So now here we're going to do something very dangerous is I'm going to try another slide. Let's see here now. No, I'm not going to do a slide for this one. I'll just tell you. I love looking at modern art. And one of my favorite artists is a woman named Pia Fries. She spells her name P-A-A-F-R-I-E-S. So I was doing searches for her work. A couple of days later, I started noticing on my Instagram feed McDonald's and Burger King ads for fries. But then I wanted fries. So I'm not really sure who's messed up in that situation, but there you go. <laughs> Why is context so hard? It's, I've always said this, and I actually put it on the front page of my site. I said, you know, the web is wonderful at content. We have more content than we know what to do with, but it is terrible at context. That's what's next. Figuring out how to take all this wonderful content and applying context to it so things just get a little better and not as crazy as they have been. The psychology behind this science is that simply put, and why the algorithms get thrown is because there's just an infinite amount of nuances that it's still to this day, we're, we're still trying to figure out how to process. Um, I remember when they had that, that AI on Jeopardy he won, the AI beat the other contestants, but there were times when it would answer a question and it would be completely off, just coming out of left field, making absolutely no sense because it didn't understand the context. And I'm sure if you've ever tried to translate Japanese from English or English to Japanese, it's still terrible because it's still trying to figure out context, especially if the languages are different enough to where you know, it's it's harder to under it's it's harder to understand the meaning behind the meaning. Now, there's a lot of different ways we can think about this in terms of context. An interesting way, and getting back to our friend Douglas Hofstadler, he talked about this concept of chunking. He talked about analogies. He's talked about chunking. Well, what's chunking? Human beings can do something very wonderful is that we can take complex information and pack it together into a concept and an idea. And then we don't need to have an explanation, a huge explanation. Let's say, for example, and I think he uses this airport. If I say airport, like, what do you think? Well, we all have this idea, right? Well, you got planes and you got the concession stand and you got all this stuff and you can actually map it out. It's a really fun thing to do. Pick something, say Tokyo, say Chicago, whatever, and just start drawing a little chart, map out like, what do you think of when you think of these things? And you get a completely different map. Everybody, we would all have a very different map depending on the experiences that we've had in our life. This is why you can have a political discussion and you have three people and you ask them what they thought, and they say three completely different things. They all heard the same speech, but depending on their life, their experiences, and how they've chunked ideas and concepts together, well, you can have very different ideas. And this is something that algorithms are getting there, but they're not quite there yet. Another fun little example is, imagine traveling back in time. Bill and Ted show up, and they got their phone booth, and they say, we're gonna go to 12th century Japan. And you're like, cool. And then you get to 12th century Japan and then there's a samurai. And they say, now go to that samurai and explain Instagram to him. Where would you start? You'd have to be like, okay, well there's computers and you gotta take these photos. Like it, it wouldn't make any sense because he hasn't had the experience to chunk all these concepts and ideas together. Now, the web is getting better with context. You're starting to see it in um, YouTube where they cite the source of the videos. I, I'm a big NHK fan. I, I, I like NHK. I know that probably makes me a dork on both countries, United States and Japan. <laughs> but 
it's interesting when I go watch it on YouTube, it now says, well, NHK is a public, you know, broadcast from, from Japan. And the more I think about it, especially the way things have played out over the last few years, the biggest thing about business advertising and all that stuff, they always said it was location, location, location. That's the big thing. I think for the near future, it's going to be credibility, credibility, credibility. We will get more on that later because we will talk a little bit about the things that have gone on in our country over the last couple of weeks. Wrapping up the advertising section of this, the bottom line is that good art, good creativity and inspiration puts you ahead of the curve right off the bat. At least in the probability game of advertising, your odds are a lot better because if you look like you know what you're doing, trust is easily obtained. If they see your advertising, it looks like you put some effort into it and it's clever and it's interesting. Like they don't need to be convinced. People will go with you and everything else works around that notion. And the best designs are they use analogy. They use the concepts of analogy to help tell the story. Now, I will have to share on my screen this time. And we're going to do some samples real quick before we get into the art section. And this is a little more seamless. Oh, how about that? So I work for a company. You can probably see on my screen here. And you might even see the people on the side. Hey, everybody. Um, I started uh, with a company called Aptude a couple of years ago. And this was the website that they had. For an IT company, it's fine. It tells a story. It gets the, it gets it gets the message across what it you know what it needs to get across. And when I talked to the vice president, um, Guy D. Rose, I said, "Well, what do you want your company to be?" He says, "Man, I want a prestige brand. Like I want to not just I don't want to just be an IT firm. I want to look good." So I said, "Hold my beer," which he had to hold for four or five months while I worked on the revisions of this website. And this is what we have now. This picture here in the front changes. It's always a different person. Because in the end, we're in the people business. In the end, we find good IT technicians to do the stuff that you need to do. So let's scroll down, shall we? And how did all this come about? So here, this is a Sumi. She's the, she's the samurai who cuts through the data. We do a lot with Power BI. And in conversations with Eric, who's our Power BI guy, and he's, he's, a, he's a, brilliant, a brilliant man. We were trying to narrow down because you see a lot of Power BI advertising, but it doesn't say anything. So, well, what does Power BI do in your mind? What does it do? He says, it just cuts through data. It slices through it. And that's when I said, aha. And so we created this character. Originally, it was going to be a Game of Thrones type person, like a big guy with an ax. And then he was, <laughs> but we couldn't really find good photos. But we found these wonderful photos of a, of a woman who is a samurai. And, and, and that became our banners. And then from there, it took off. The character came from the fact that um, Erich wanted to give away t-shirts. And my boss was like, I don't know, t-shirts. I don't think anyone cares. And that's why I said, hold my beer. So now the guy has two beers in his hand. And I say, let's create something cool. And this character came out of it, slice through your data. We, we can't even keep the t-shirts in house. Once again, if it's cool, people, people will like it. Here, transportation systems, this is a little bit more straightforward. You know, we work a lot with logistics. And so we just basically took some of our dashboards and we overlaid it over a truck. Clear and simple. Just it's just an easy way. You instantly know what's going on. This one is even more basic because <laughs> how do you talk about application support? So we literally put a wrench into a phone. There's an icon of a phone. Done. That's it. If it takes you more than three to five seconds to figure out what's going on, you've lost your audience. This was a way for us to express the fact that we do application support, it's visual, it's interesting. It's 10 o'clock. And it's 10 o'clock here in Chicago. <laughs> Finally, you can go with this robotic process automation. You can see our guy here. You got 587 emails, he's telling her. Um, that's just kind of a gag. You know, robotic process automation is something also too that's really, really hard for people to understand. And we try to find clever and fun ways to express what we do for our data science campaign. Like, is your data out of control? Here we go. Like she's, she's going crazy. I watch a lot of Japanese movies, as you can tell. So Kaiju is definitely in my vocabulary. 
So here she's like freaking out. And for all of the imagery that we did for data science, we used laboratory imagery. So here, like a lot of the warning signs, we went to a laboratory. So they go, oh, they've got these orange signs and stuff that say, oh my God, like, you know, these are dangerous. And we, we created each and every icon. And then when it came down to our data science, like what we do, because we do so many different things, we turned it into a periodic table of elements. This isn't the most original idea. Other people have done it in the past. The trick is, is to do it really, really well. And we found this to be a very clever and interesting way to break down, well, basically, well, look at this is a lot of stuff to try to understand. So we found this to be a really, really useful tool to sort of expedite that process, to help people understand what it is we do. And if you want to have a lot of fun, I can, I can find it real quick here. Let's see here. Data science. We actually have a periodic table of data science you can download, um, which is it's pretty cute, and it's uh, it's got a let's see, it parts my, my my internet will probably go real slow. So there you go. So you can download this. We created it like a 1950s sort of like like flyer, like something you might find uh, in a in a retro in a retro shop, including little atoms and things like that. And we have the little teacher who yells at you because you're not paying attention. So. That, that was a fun project to work on. But I'm not just gonna talk about the stuff I do. I like to also talk about other people and give credit where credit is due. Tolson Design out of San Francisco is followed for 20 years, ever since they put out that book, Wash, Soak, Rinse, Spin. They're amazing. And honestly, I mean, I wish I were these guys. So this was a case study. They recently did a launch for the Stone Mill Matcha Company, right? And and you look at it, they used watercolors to help express, oh, of course I got a network here. Come on, buddy. <laughs> they used the idea of watercolor to help kind of inform the brand. I mean, look at this, that's watercolor. If you're talking about using analogy as a way to like convey an idea, I mean, look right there, look at, gosh, this is wonderful. Look at this, I love this. This, and, it, and honestly, when I looked at all these different things, I did a lot of research on this, I found that this particular one was the best way to describe that idea. When I say analogy, imagery, analogous images as a way to inform people about your brand. I mean, and it's gorgeous. I, if I, I mean, when next time I'm in San Francisco, when we're allowed to go outside again, I'm going here. And a fun little side fact, so I did try to look for other samples, but, um, I was looking at these guys, RGNA and Hair. We designed business and brands for a more human future. We just talked about this 20 minutes ago. It's already cliche. Make your advertising more human. Okay, it's out there. We all know. Uh, wah, wah. <laughs> and, that, and I think that's going to cover the end of our advertising portion. So now we're going to move to modern art. And since I got the screen, we're going to go ahead and start it right now. In December of 2019, this was the talk of the art world. Somebody taped a banana to the wall and sold it for $120,000. Now, I can't blame COVID-19 because this happened, that this is why COVID-19 happened, but and I shouldn't because, you know, in the misinformation world of the web, someone's going to run with that and say, oh, you know, what was that banana? That's why I was. But still, when we had problems that weren't related to COVID-19, this was the big problem. Someone paying that much money for a banana. Now, I don't know if you followed the story, this banana was shown at Art Basel in December of 2019 and it had sold. And some guy the next day decided to run over and eat this banana. And he said that was his art piece. It was an like, interpretive art. And we all got like a chuckle out of it. Now, as you know, not only am I an art director and, and a designer, I'm also an artist. My wife is also an artist and a painter. Now, this is the kind of stuff we do. This is hers on the left, this is mine on the right. Needless to say, this takes a lot more time and effort. And we're not selling these for 120K. So we're like, well, we need to just start taping stuff to the wall. So we started with this carrot. This was our piece that we tried to <laughs> the one bought. And then when that guy ate the banana, my wife decided, well, then I should eat the carrot and I will paint myself up as a mime. Now, and the best part, by the way, I have no idea if this story is going over very well at all. It's, it's like I'm in a neck. <laughs> I can't tell if you're getting a kick out of it or not. 
course, we had this empty space on the wall after my wife ate the carrot. So we had to fill in a spot. Um, and an artist named Sergio Gomez, his daughter put up an Etsy shop a couple of years ago. And she was selling these cute little like knitted things. And it, one of them was a banana. So we decided to hang it up. We sent the picture to them and it's still on our wall to this day. So bananas are in fact awesome. And honestly, I might pay 120K for that. And maybe not for the banana that the guy ate on the wall. <laughs> now, if you're wondering like, what the hell is a story all about? And believe me, I'm kind of wondering myself, is that the art world has always been filled with this sort of pretentious gotcha stuff. Believe me, like as an artist and as friends, and we hang out with a lot of people in, the, in an art circle, it drives us crazy too. It's like the extremist faction that causes trouble that you end up apologizing for all the time. But I also think it stinks because it makes modern art feel pretentious and inaccessible. And that's just, that's just not cool. Like that's not, that's not right. And believe me, so when you're seeing something like that and, and you're annoyed by it, we are too. And this is nothing new, especially in the days of the late 20th century in conceptual art. You know, the shock became more important than the craftsmanship. I remember as a kid in 1989, an artist named Dred Scott, because of course, or sets of whether his name was Dred Scott, decided to do an installation piece where they put an American flag on the floor and people walked on it and you wrote like what you felt. And of course, everyone got into an uproar. And this seems to happen every two or three years. It's because as human beings, we have two ways of looking at the world, of thinking of the world, right? And we have system one thinking, which is our emotional quick logic, you know, like emotional quick snap judgment. And we have our system two thinking, which is logical, it's long term, it take it's slower, we have to process things. That schlock art just goes right to system one. That's why it gets all the press. That's why it's there. Personally, I like to work in that system two vicinity. As Sean Connery once said, I prefer my audiences stirred, not shaken. And besides, shock art over time tends to fade into obscurity. Now, if you're wondering, like, what does modern art have to do with, you know, advertising well, a lot? Because quite honestly, what you see in modern art ends up becoming the advertising of the future. Um, Andy Warhol, Jim Henson, before they became famous artisans and crafts, you know, Jim Henson who did the Muppets and Andy Warhol did the paintings of the soup can, they were, they were graphic designers and Jim Henson did a lot of commercials. And Takashi Murakami, I mean, come on. He's done, he's done, a, oh God, Kanye West, King Cootie, he's done a lot of album covers and he's done a lot of work and his work is great. He, uh, his work was used uh, as an influence for a Billie Eilish video, last, I think it was last year or the year before. So yeah, when you look at modern art I and mean, you look at like where the art world is headed, that's where advertising's going. Now, if you're wondering, well, that's great and all, but the problem is, is if I do a search on Google for modern art, I just see that banana or whatever. Like the problem is, is that Google and Pinterest are nice, but once again, the algorithms fail you. When you type in modern art examples or good modern art, it's just gonna try to find what it thinks is the best example of that by, by how the, by what was embedded in the meta tags, right? So I'm a firm believer that you need things curated if you want to really get to the good stuff. So if you want to start, I'm just going to give you the pure heroin version of this. Here, start with these. I want to make a big thump so it has that like impression. That, boom. Vitamin P, one, two, and three. I'm more showing you this too because when you see how many pages are in here, you probably haven't seen this. You've seen the banana, you've seen some dumb stuff, but within these books is some of the best and most inspirational art. You'll probably hate half of it, but the other half you're gonna love. And it's, you can find them, I did double check. Vi uh, vitamin P1 and three is available in Japan and the United States. Vitamin P2 is a little bit harder to find, but they also have drawing, they have <laughs> photography. Um, these are put up by, uh, I think, Phaedon. And the most important lesson to take from this is, is if you're interested in modern art, if you're interested in bringing that inspiration to your life, grab, don't search right now, it'll get better. 
but grab a book because somebody actually put that together. Somebody actually thought about it. And those particular ones, I mean, I've seen a lot of modern art books in my time. I've read a lot of marketing books, a lot, 90% of them are terrible. And those actually are pretty, pretty damn good. Now, if you want to make modern art a part of your life, a lot of you are not artists, you, but you like art, you know, from a business level, here's just a fun little idea. I, I knew like a, a, an art, it was an architecture, uh, it, they were architects and they were out in Batavia and they had a lot of wall space. So they would actually have art shows once a month. They would bring in local artists. And I think after COVID, people are gonna wanna get out of the house. So if you're running a company, if you happen to have a place that you wanna hang up some walls, the idea of actually having art shows in your facility is a wonderful way to not only bring in clients, but it's also, as it's been proven, having art in your home or having art in your office boosts productivity. It's extremely important and it's more important and it's, and it's so microtransactional that a lot of times you may not be able to calculate it, but it is there and it does accumulate over time. Now, in terms of the 2020s, when you look at art and advertising, like what can we expect? Well, if you kind of notice that the 2020s have started off pretty shaky. And so, especially in this age of people trying to want realism, but also they want to, they want authenticity. This is going to be a reoccurring theme for this decade. I'm starting to notice that much of the new work that's being put out, both in modern art and in advertising, is very um, organic, paint splats, handwriting. Thanks to Google Fonts, you can now do handwriting fonts for your, your website, and people are really utilizing that now. Organic textures. Um, you're seeing this for a couple of reasons. One, because of obviously recent events. We, uh, we're, we're, anytime you have an action, you have an equal opposite reaction. But also too, because the generations that are coming up, they like, it's funny, about every 30 years, you kind of get this counterculture movement coming in. The 1960s, the 1990s, hello 2020s. Roughly 30 years, so to speak. And, and by the way, it's interesting because, you know, no, learning my history of Japan, you know, in 1968, there was the big Shinjuku incident. And of course, in 1968, we had plenty of shootings at campuses. Like it, it was interesting how, how things paralleled. Um, and you're starting to see it now leak into pop culture. It's interesting because like I remember in the 80s or in the 50s, especially in America, the clean cut, clean shave and all that was kind of in. And then all of a sudden people kind of got dissatisfied with the status quo. In the 60s, it was because of the, the Vietnam War. Actually for both countries in many ways, it was about the Vietnam War. For America, we didn't want our college kids going. In Japan, you didn't want the base to be there because you felt a little, you know, and rightfully so, it was, it was, a, it was a uncomfortable thing. In the 1990s, a lot of it was pushing back on the overwhelming uh, corporations, business. Like it felt like it was becoming a lie. In 2020s, uh, take your pick as to what you want to rebel against. Now, it's funny because in the 2010s, when social media really became predominant, it all became a game of likes. So nobody wanted to be the weird artsy person. It was everything was bubblegum coated. Everything was like shiny, happy, like, yeah, you could be a little controversial, but you never wanted to be too much because it was really important to get those views and get those likes. And I kept wondering, well, my God, like if everybody's always competing to be the most saccharine, to be the most happy, like what's gonna happen to counterculture? Well, obviously world events have kicked that into gear. The fact that you have somebody like Billie Eilish suggests that, you know, she's, she's different, but she's relating to people. And, you know, you think about it, and over the 2010s, you had artists like Kendrick Lamar, Savages, Wednesday Campanella. The artsy, interesting ones were happening, and some of them had very, very great success. And now you have bands like Billie Eilish, I'm sorry, musicians like Billie Eilish, Idols, the band out of, like, London, The Weeknd. Um, he's recently showing himself all bruised up and beat up. Like, you wouldn't have done that 10 years ago. You're not going to get a lot of thumbs up if you show yourself all beat up. Um, and then in Japan, like Aya Gloomy and Bish, like it's now the counterculture is coming back. And that means credibility, the whole thing about keeping it real. I don't know if you ever heard the term, don't sell out. That means something again. 
in the previous generation, if you said, you know, you don't want to sell out, they'd say, well, why not? Because don't you want to sell tickets? Did you want to, the, the idea of like selling your soul or the idea of selling your integrity for an extra dollar, it comes and it goes, it's coming back. And also besides the sort of hand crafted textural things that we're all like going to start seeing, um, you're going to see um, a draw to realism. And what I mean by that is we think about like post 9-11 in America, um, two spy movies came out the following year. One was Jason Bourne and one was James Bond. Jason Bourne was serious, gritty, stripped down. And that James Bond movie was the last with Pierce Brosnan. I think he surfed into North Korea. It was the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. And we were turned off. When bad things happen, people want to get serious and people want something that's real and means something. When I was reading this one book, um, a collection of essays of Japanese artists um, post World War II, many of them, um, many of them wanted real. They wanted something authentic because they needed to understand the world now as it is. And, and the real abstractions, the things that were happening like in Europe before the war, they weren't as interested in that anymore because they wanted, they, they needed to have something tangible to hold on to. And anything that felt too artistic or pretentious wasn't, wasn't an interest. Now I'm realizing I have got three more pages of notes that I am definitely not going to get to. So let's talk about, and we're going to focus on the third part, and this is going to bleed into US Japan relations. Now, Personally, like I found myself really deep diving into Japanese culture a few years ago. I think a lot of it had to do with the events that were happening here in America. But the one thing I started to realize, because you know, we don't have kids, but a lot of our friends have cool kids and they're cool, they were really into anime. So I kind of naturally assumed, well, I guess everyone's into anime because they're into it. But as it turns out, no, anime is actually the counterculture here in the United States. And I think it's extremely important for our, our cultures to intermingle. Be why? Because from a geopolitical standpoint, the United States and Japan need to get really tight. We're gonna be the most important relationship, geopolitically speaking, for the next 50 years. We can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But that being said, I can tell you, like America is interested, we get it. There's a wonderful documentary by a French production company named Archipel. And what they did is they talked about the resurgence of Japanese video games. And in 2017, 2018, you started to see things like Persona 5, Near Automata, Gravity Rush 2, known as Gravity Days 2, popping up. And we gobbled it up. And why was that? Because when you talk to the game designers, they said, we found that Americans, they tend to do big blockbuster stuff or really tiny indie stuff. We went for that middle channel. Something that was just not too glitzy, not too crazy, but at the same time, not like super indie, not like tiny. There was this whole area in the middle that just literally wasn't being explored. And I think that's a wonderful place where our two cultures can start to combine. And even then, like the, one of the biggest games last year was a game called Ghosts of uh, Tsushima, which was actually produced by an American company. It was the fastest selling first party original PS4 game with more than 5 million copies sold since July of 2020. You can play in Akira Kurosawa mode, which is black and white, um, and, and in Japanese with subtitles if you can't speak Japanese. The more evidence that I see, the more I realize America is on board. And why is that? Well, we look at, and this is the third part, US-Japan relations, and I'll try to keep it brief. Basically, a lot of bad things have happened here in this country. We're divided. We're trying to figure things out. We've seen this coming from a mile away. For the last 40 years, movies and books have talked about the fact that America, two sides of America are not talking to each other anymore. And when we get confused, a lot of times we like to look outside of ourselves. I know for a fact that for me, watching NHA and looking at Japanese culture, there's something about that accountability to one another that is immediately appealing to many people like us who have seen just a lot of crazy things happening over the last few years. And I think that Japan, especially with 
the Olympics and no one's really knowing what's going to happen with it. There, you, I know we want to gain ground. Like Japan wants to gain ground. They want to have that cultural impact. They want to get there. And I think America's craving what it is that the, what Japan is doing. And oh, unfortunately, I think I'm going to run out of time because I do want to get to a Q and A. Um, I will leave it at this. I think there are plenty of places where Japan and the United States can collaborate. I think there's, you know, I would love to see the Cherry Cokes playing here at St. Patrick's Day in Chicago at a parade. When I play uh, baseball on the PS4, I'd love to see Japanese baseball teams there. I would love to see um, interior designers using more Japanese elements because I think as the 2020s, which is predicted to be a very crazy and very nutty geopolitical decade are going to want something that's more linear and more simple and that brings calm. I mean, Marie Kondo is just the beginning. And in my final statement, this intermingling of cultural ideas puts members of both of our cultures within this shared special club, right? We can change the course of both of our societies. America we tend to lean very much towards the, the crazy, independent, we can't even get everybody on the same page. And in Japan, it's the exact opposite. It's about brotherhood, it's about fraternity, but sometimes it's hard because there's a lot of rigmarole and there's a lot of things that we have to, you know, you, you kind of want a little bit of that independence. And I think that as we come together, we can learn from one another and not only improve our our countries and who we are, but also create a sense of stability in the world, which is going to be desperately needed. So, and then getting back to the beginning, in 1982, when I was that kid, my grandmother came and visited us. My grandma and grandpa lived in Texas. They met in World War II. My grandmother was from the Philippines. Needless to say, my grandparents didn't have uh, the best experience, but I know my grandmother, she always would say that she never, she never blamed anybody for anything. She said, the world just kind of goes crazy sometimes. And I don't have kids. And my brothers, we just, we don't have kids. So our family ends with us. And I figure, hey, if I can play a little part in this and in, in just keeping our countries together, being inspirational, just, just finding little ways to keep the peace that was so hard fought for, then I think it's a life well lived. So, and I feel bad, there's so much more I wanted to cover, but I won't too long. So really like take, take it, I'll let, you, I'll let you run with it. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really beautiful session. Um, I feel everybody else feels the same. Um, so I'm gonna give you about five minutes, Michael, so you can take a little rest because you've been speaking for all this while um, and everybody else, uh, everybody on the call, if you guys have any questions, any suggestions, if you guys want to share something, if you want to talk about something, uh, you can do it in one of the two ways, either write it on the chat and then we can ask the questions to Michael or if you want to talk, you can just simply, you know, take the mic. I'm gonna give you give you all like five minutes to decide if you guys have questions. Well, actually, I can start answering questions. I'm good. Oh, cool. So I'm guys, from Chicago, I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they call it the Windy City because of all this, the talking. It's not because of the wind. I mean, we it is windy, but it's because of the bluster and the politics. No wonder. <laughs> all right. So real quick, feel free to chime in if you have any questions. I'm sure everyone's brain is blown and melted and I do apologize for that. I know I can talk a lot. Um, and if you don't think of any now, or if we don't get to them as a person who knows, I'm always the guy who never gets their question answered. Just ping me on LinkedIn, ask me. I know, what do you think the New York Mets are gonna do this year? I'll answer it, sure, let's do it. <laughs> I think William has a question. He said, I'm curious what else you wanted to cover actually. Oh. I really I'm wanted to get. Oh, what was, no, I was that? Gonna say, yeah, no, you said you wanted to talk about a bunch of more other stuff, but if there was something, anything else that was like particularly pressing or important, I can put the notes up. Um, what I really wanted to get into was why the U.S.-Japan relation is so important. Um, what we're understanding about what's happening with China, whether it rises or falls, there's different ideas. Um, if you read the CSIS report, um, which was about, you can tell it was interesting. The 
America is really, really interested in having a great relationship with Japan and vice versa. And it's because we understand it's critical to help contain some of the, uh, the ongoing sort of worries that are happening over there. And of course, China is the first thing that's brought up. There are two trains of thought. One, people think that China is gonna rise and become a superpower. Other people are looking at it like, no, this is like the Enron of countries. They are so over overspent and overcredited that it's just a matter of time. Either way, it's horrific. Either way, it's not, it's, this is not gonna be fun. Um, but it, regardless, I think that makes the, the emphasis of US-Japan relationships even all the more important. It's, it's, literally, it's literally gonna be saving lives. Right. Did I, mean, I, did, did I get it? <laughs> no, yeah, I was just looking at, um, I, was, I was having, you know, I'm half Japanese, half American. So I think about this a lot naturally. And um, I was, uh, I'm not actually terribly too familiar with, uh, Japan US relations actually because um I get enough of it just living in between the two worlds um yeah. but uh just seeing the amount of debt that uh the US is in uh in relation to Japan and the states and uh the the Americans that I meet here and I talk to here um seem to share exactly that same notion of how they really believe that you know the US uh, U.S.'s relation to Japan is going to be critical for their own survival because, uh, for the you know for the uh, the survival of the states because Japan holds on to a lot of values and I think, you know at least on the surface it seems they've ex they've managed to execute capitalism better than the United States has, and has managed to keep their the peace in a, in and you know equality relatively speaking, um, compared to the United States. So I, I see, you know, I see this from a, a lot of different angles, and um, it's it's also interesting to sort of think about this more in light of, you know, the original topic of marketing and the consumerism in general, because I think just the attitude and the values that um, the uh, you know the, the two countries appeal to are so fundamentally different. And you know, you meant, you briefly mentioned Marty Kondo and stuff, and uh, you know, perhaps the rising trends of um, you know simplicity and you know. Uh, more, I don't know, down to earth uh, values that I think Japan holds uh, very, very dear to their culture. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious as to, uh, you know, what, at least from someone in the United States, because I've been living in Japan practically my whole life, what, how the U.S. sees Japan, because I only get um, a glimpse of that every now and then when I talk to Americans here. It depends on obviously what part of the country. One thing I didn't get to cover, especially people who are in Japan who want to do business with Americans, is you know what are Americans like? And it's like, well, we're still trying to figure that out. I mean, there's really two countries for sure that we know of that are in America, probably five or six. Um, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, if you're in Seattle, like I think that people in more urban areas are more open and more interested in Japan. I think overall, I think America is interested in Japan. Um, and the reason being is because if you look at it from a historical perspective, and by the way, a, a gentleman named Matthew Alt, I gotta get the exact name of this book. He wrote a, I just recently finished it. It's a wonderful book about pop culture in Japan. And he literally goes through the decades, starting with um, you know, the tin Jeeps that were made after World War II um, to Hello Kitty. And you start to realize that, you know, the relationship between US and Japan after World War II is a little contentious. So you really weren't sure like how to feel about one another. And then when Japan's economy exploded in the eighties, we saw Japan as a threat again. And I remember being a little kid and then and that was kind of the dialogue, but now in the nineties and the O's and now in the tens, I mean, you know, grandparents are playing Pokemon go, uh, you know, with their kids, like America's become more Japanese and J Japan has become more Americanized. Right. And I think right now is a very, very interesting time for the countries to intermingle. I did a podcast with uh, Mr. Guevara, Guevara San, the one before this where we talked about basically the concept is you know i think uh, the superhero movies are dead and i think video game movies are going to become the thing for the 2020s because people are going to want some seriousness and some realism and we literally i have this paid like thesis about how to turn persona 5 into a into a, a, a three-part trilogy um and that's just really kind of the story of the idea that i think that if it's not that idea i think there's so much rich material in Japan, Final Fantasy. Uh, I mean, you just start just start naming them. That I think I think America is ready to start consuming what it is. So I think at that at that mm -hmm. kind of roundabout answers your question. 
I, yeah, I no, think it, it's prime. I, it's, I think it's an unknown unknown right now, but I think it's ready. Yeah, it's also very interesting because, you know, having been in Japan my whole life, and even though I have American blood in me, whenever I go to the States, Americans have a completely different perspective or perception of Japan than I do of it. Um, yes. It's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, the frog in the well or whatever you want to call it. It's, you know, you're kind of oblivious to the environment and the how the other the people on the outside perceive you. Um, but, you know, it kind of goes both ways, like the way that Japanese people perceive the states is very different from how the people in the states perceive themselves. So um, that that perspective taking is, um, I think, is also going to be key, because I, I, I know a lot of Americans that come to Japan naively believing that everything is kind of like that anime world, only to realize that, you know, they were completely you know, delusional, basically, but, you know, yeah. but no, I, I get it. The, the expectations are, are not what, what they, what they think. And right. I think it's just, I think it's just ignorance and immaturity a little bit. Um, but we'll get there. I, I, yeah. I like yeah. I said, I, I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna change. I should add, we should ask if I'm sorry, I, I could talk to all you guys um, all day, but we should double check and, and feel free to hit me up afterwards. So I really, I'd love to talk to you some more. Thank you. All right. Uh, anybody else has any questions for Michael? Anyone? Uh, yeah, I actually have one question in relation to Japanese culture and how uh, the culture is featured in Western design. But uh, first of all, Michael, thank you so much for your uh, presentation earlier. It was really thought provoking. So thank you so much. Um, so You're my welcome. question is, thank yeah, thank you. Um, so my question is, how has Japan managed to consistently appeal to Western designers, especially throughout the decades, uh, while other Asian countries, which you know also have really uh, appealing and equally as rich culture, how do they remain less explored in the realm of design and lifestyle? And why has Japan managed to be one of the more predominant uh, features in design? Well, I think... The begin it, it, it all starts with the fact that Japan is amazing at soft power. I mean, other countries do it well, but Japan really, really gets it. And so right off the bat, I think that, and once again, I'll actually refer to, to Matthew Alt's book in this. He started to notice that our culture became more Japanese and, 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 and vice versa. And a perfect example, like I grew up in the 80s. So there was Ghostbusters cartoons. There was all these things. A lot of those cartoons in the 80s, like Transformers, they were done by Japanese studios and by Japanese artisans. So it was already in, the cultures were already starting to embed themselves within one another. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's known that, you know, obviously America, you know, America really impacted Japan in the 60s and especially in the 70s, um, where Japan became very Western. Um, that being said, I just think that once again, I think just Japan does it better. I think that I think that it's because our countries have worked very hard to be on very friendly terms. I think it's just of all the of, all, of a lot of countries in Asia, it's just a little bit more accessible. Japan is also a very stable country, and and I would even say too that there's a certain consistency and and minimalistic style. To, to, to Japan that I, I think Americans find very attractive. I can even just say from just a personal point of view, um, I was you know, really getting into Japanese culture and I, and I tell my friends and they kind of like think, oh, that's kind of interesting. But then, you know, especially YouTube, there are so many videos about life in Japan and street walks, like walking through Shinjuku or walking through Osaka at night. There are all this, oh, there's so much content. And then I found that our friends would watch this stuff and say, oh my God, this country is amazing. And I know it's, it's, it's always the grass is greener on the other side. I understand that. But I, I think that it's just in the end, the way Japan presents itself, it's a soft power. It doesn't come across as aggressive. I think of, you know, other countries kind of come across a little like a spooky. Uh, Japan has always been very friendship first. And I think, I think that's why it, it has the advantage. And also to point out honestly, it's the it's like the third fourth largest economy in the world and the and the art the anime the it's the it's wonderful it is that's it that's it hands down i i, I can't get enough of it i i think it's, it's it's just there's some really amazing things happening there and good is good it kind of goes back to the beginning you know i think if you create good content and you create good stuff people gravitate towards it that's 90 percent of the battle 
I hope that roundabout answers your question. <laughs> yeah, definitely did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, any more question, guys? Okay, I, I think that's about it. Everyone's exhausted. I'm gonna go have some whiskey myself, right? <laughs> cheers, cheers to that. <laughs> well, if you can't think of any, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn, my website. Um, and uh, I didn't get a chance to mention this too. There is one other thing. Um, we have a book out. My friend Russell and I called Manifestos, Reinventions, and Declarations. So feel free to check that out. Um, there is a wonderful chapter in there called The Declaration of Interdependence, which in some ways also inspired the talk today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you once again for uh, giving us a beautiful session. And uh, everybody else on the call, thank you so much, guys, for logging in. If you have any further questions or anything, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I am sure you guys have seen us on LinkedIn already, but either way, I'll share the links on the chat as well for you guys to connect. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Michael.